In this episode of History in a Build, I will discuss the interesting but brief history of aircraft that were purpose-built for Japan's special attack units, otherwise known as kamikaze. I'll be discussing a few of these purpose-built designs, but the focus will be on the quirky and ultimately unused Japanese Army Ki-115 Tsurugi. Then I'll show you how I built the Edward Tsurugi in 48th scale. So strap in and hold on as we dive in with the Tsurugi, a purpose-built kamikaze. By the summer of 1944, it had to be clear to the Japanese Army and Navy that they could no longer count on conventional warfare to defeat, or at least stem the tide of the Allies in the Pacific. Earlier in 1944, the U.S. Navy, Army, and Marines dealt a series of crippling defeats to the Japanese, not the least of which was the air battle that took place during the Battle of the Philippine Sea that ultimately came to be known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The Turkey Shoot resulted in over 600 planes and pilots lost for the Japanese. Some weeks later, during the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese lost another 300 planes and pilots as well as their ability to conduct carrier operations for the remainder of the conflict. These losses, coupled with an incredibly effective submarine campaign, had multiple effects on Japanese thinking. One of the most obvious was, at least for the purposes of this video, was that the air power of the U.S. became dominant and Japan could no longer or no longer had the ability to replace its trained pilots. Future pilots, were going to be nowhere near as proficient as they were earlier in the war. Facing an imminent defeat, the strategy of the Japanese government was changed to that of causing as much damage and killing as many allied forces as possible, with the ultimate objective of negotiating a conditional surrender with terms that were more favorable to the Japanese. And one of the strategies in achieving this was to use suicide attacks. Now there was definitely a progression of the use of airplanes for suicide attacks on US ships. At first, these attacks could almost be considered as impulsive crashes made by Japanese pilots as a last resort, such as when their planes had su suffered severe damage and they did not want to risk being captured or they simply wanted to do as much damage to the enemy as possible if they were gonna crash anyway. These were first noted by the US Navy as early as 1942. But the progression from there was not straightforward. It was almost as if, before the fall of 1944, the use of suicide planes was a unit decision and not one ordered from the highest levels of the armed forces. The US Navy experienced slightly more organized attacks during their campaign in the Philippines, especially in the battles around Leyte in October of 1944. The start of the official kamikaze campaign occurred in late 44, and were at their most intense during the Okinawa campaign, where the US Navy suffered their worst casualties of the war. These attacks were carried out by relatively well-trained crews flying conventional aircraft that were rigged as suicide airplanes. These were mainly older Zeros, Judys, and Oscars. There were also two engine bombers flown as kamikaze aircraft. Compared to a conventional attack where the odds of placing a bomb or torpedo on a US Navy ship were extremely low, a kamikaze attack had a much better chance of hitting a ship and causing severe damage. Indeed, the organized kamikaze campaign during Okinawa resulted in severe damage to several fleet carriers and hundreds of other ships, as well as the loss of a dozen destroyers and even more landing ships. Despite these horrific losses of trained pilots and aircraft, the Japanese high command knew they were having an effect. They also knew the next likely invasion point and they were preparing to meet the Allies with a litany of suicide devices. Due to the diminishing supply of skilled pilots, both the Army and Navy were busy manufacturing purpose-built kamikaze airplanes that were designed to be easy to construct by unskilled labor and easy to fly by pilots with little to no training. These were the Navy's Oka and the Army's Suruki. 
The MXY-7, or Oka, was less of an airplane and more of a human-controlled glide bomb with a solid propellant rocket booster. It was designed to be carried into battle under a Betty bomber. The pilot would climb into the aircraft from inside the open bomb bay. When a target was sighted, the pilot would detach from the mother ship, and with some rudimentary flight controls, he could point the Oka at a large warship. The rocket would then be lit to power the Oka in a final dive. This aircraft required experienced pilots, and there was actually a training regimen for them to familiarize themselves. A prospective Oka pilot was required to perform at least three successful practice drops before being qualified to propel himself into an enemy ship. A few Okas did make it into combat, although the majority of the time the carrier Betty was shot down well before the Oka was launched. Some three destroyers were sunk or severely damaged by these Oka attacks. Witnesses to these attacks also noted that there was a considerable amount of near misses, and it was surmised that the Oka was probably very difficult to control in its final dive. While the Oka required experienced pilots to fly, it was hoped that the Nakajima Ki-115 Surugi, meaning sword, could be built in the thousands by unskilled labor and flown by novice pilots. However, this was not to be. The design was simple, a wood structure that was skinned with galvanized steel. The circular fuselage was simple to construct and mate to the stubby wings. And this was a true suicide aircraft. A bomb would be permanently bolted onto the airframe and once airborne, the main gear would break away and fall off the aircraft. While the Surugi was simpler to construct, actually flying this thing proved to be a challenge even for experienced test pilots. The initial prototypes featured wings that were too stubby to generate sufficient lift, and the single-use breakaway gear made it impossible to taxi and take off. Despite improvements to the design, production stopped at a little over 100 airframes because of the number of training accidents and pilot deaths. No surugi was ever used in combat. I suspect the wing loading and the power of the 850 horsepower engine would have made this quite a handful for any pilot. I first came across this airplane when I visited the Pima Air and Space Museum, and as you can see in these pictures, the airframe has seen better days, but it was never meant to be more than a single-use aircraft. The Edward 48th scale Surugi comes in a nice package. It is a true multimedia kit. There is a photo etch set. There are paint masks included. And this isn't one of those reboxes. This is a true original Edward kit from about 20 years ago, around 2004. Quality wise, I'd say it's on par with 1990s Hasegawa or Tamiya in that there were a few build issues. Some of the parts were actually hard to snip off the runners, like they have really tight fit. And there were some uh, gaps that needed to be addressed. Actually, in this video, I'm going to show you three main parts of this build being the cockpit, addressing these gaps and painting and finishing. And with the cockpit, what I'm trying to show is how I do wood finishes in a relatively simple way. This cockpit features a wooden floor. And because it is in a fighter plane, once this thing is closed up and the canopy in place, you're just not gonna see that much of it. So the goal here is to have a simulation of wood that's reasonable, but I really wouldn't spend a lot of time and effort doing it. I start by painting the cockpit with Tamiya's deck tan and a few drops of uh, their clear so I can get a nice sheen and the reason I'm doing that is to make the next step in this process a little bit easier. Um, I'm spraying this relatively wet so that I can get a nice clear smooth finish and that'll help with the next step which is going to be spreading on some weathering color. So this is about to get relatively messy. What I'm going to do is drip on some Mr. Hobby, uh, Mr. Weathering color. It's, a, it's an enamel based weathering product. Uh, 
and you don't have to be precise you don't have to be uh, surgical here you can be as messy as you want because most of this you're going to be taking off i'm just dipping it on here the part and the next step is going to be taking a old paintbrush so if you got something with stiff bristles the, the stiffer the bristles the better and with that you're just going to be um, wicking off or scraping off the uh, the weathering product in order to make the wood grain on the wood wood pieces and it doesn't have to be pretty it it's just needs to get that hint of wood grain the reason why i use the tamiya deck tan is that the part is going to get darker no matter what you do so it's good to start with a, a lighter color underneath and as you're scraping away the wood grain uh, it, it is going to stay in the underneath uh, or the, the base color so the darker you go then it just becomes very very dark and because this is an enamel based product it takes a while to dry and so if the wood grain that you you have uh, see at, the, at this initial stage the wood grain is quite heavy and it actually looks fairly uneven so it doesn't matter um, what you can do is what i'm doing here is you just keep scraping you keep using those uh, heavy bristles to gradually make uh, a realistic or believable wood grain surface on the part and i believe that um, after about uh, you can actually work this out maybe upwards of 10 minutes of uh, making it the way that you want. When I put the base coat on these parts, the floor and the chair, I put a few drops of Tamiya Clear in so that I could make it a semi-gloss finish. And I find that with semi-gloss, I have a little bit more control over making the wood grains on the parts but this isn't necessary i'm very sure that if you went with a flat base coat only you'd get the same effect it might be a bit less forgiving as you can see with the chair i'm trying to get some wood grain but there's not a lot of surface area in terms of getting a brush stroke and getting that nice wood grain finish but like i said with this technique if you mess up and you take up take off too much of it just put a little bit more of the weathering product on get that uh, stiff bristled brush going and get it to where you need it to be So as you can see here, I still felt that the grain was a little bit too heavy on the floor. So this had dried in the interim, maybe about uh, five, 10 minutes, and I was still able to knock down the wood grain to something that I was a bit more satisfied with. The parts on the floor also had an aluminum component. So just mask it off and uh, carefully spray the aluminum uh, bits with an airbrush and that'll complete that nice cockpit floor for you and when it's all done you'll see that you'll have some nice contrast of wood grain and uh, aluminum finish here is the completed cockpit and I also have a picture of the completed engine for this kit if you're interested in how I complete model engines I do have a separate video on that Older kits are pretty much guaranteed to give you gaps every now and then. Sometimes I even run into this on newer releases as well. And back in the day, if I had a gap such as this, I would have taken some Tamiya gray putty, slapped it in there with a toothpick, smoothed it out, and then sanded it down, obliterating most of the detail. And later on, I probably would have tried to save some of that detail but now I have a 
bit more of a surgical approach to fixing gaps like this. If it's one of these hairline things, I will use some very thin plastic card, some evergreen, like 5,000 sheet, that type of thing, to start to fill it with some plastic. And I find that doing it this way prevents the gap from showing up later on as a fine depression. That was my biggest thing with using a lot of putty is um, that depression or that ghost depression that might come later on after you've finished painting it. And uh, using the plastic card this way, I can just sand it down or file it down, getting and really carefully with, uh, with a lot of care, making sure not to obliterate any of that other detail. Before I do this, I even sometimes take a needle and emphasize the rivet holes just a little bit more so that I can preserve them even that much better. And as you can see, I'm using um, a, a fairly coarse sanding stick uh, and taking my time in order to sand down that plastic and make it level. I'm using fine sanding sticks to do this. I'm not using very coarse ones. So the second one here is just to remove any of the scratches that I might have left with the slightly coarser one and to get it polished out as best that I can. Now this next step that I do uh, might be controversial to some, but I'm using Vallejo's plastic putty and this uh, product for some reason has gotten a bad rap and I think it's absolutely fantastic if it's used in the proper way or at least the way that works for me and that is to only use it in extremely fine uh, gaps that you can't fill with plastic because it is one of these products that you just uh, that, that is very foolproof you just uh, place it on with a, with a very thin tip and then you remove it with a moistened um, Q-tip The beauty of this is if you've taken off a little too much just reapply and do it again. I Am showing in this video uh, Very very quickly how how this is done. I would I would do it maybe uh, let it dry just a little tiny bit more than I'm demonstrating here but this is not like a putty um, such as the squadron putty or the Tamiya stuff you don't want this to dry and you don't want to have to sand this this is strictly for filling gaps and uh, and I find that this product works spectacular for that type of um, for that type of use So as you can see, I've used two different techniques to address this gap and it's not doing too bad, but I'm going to use one more here just to um, completely seal this thing and make it absolutely perfect. And what I'm doing here is I'm using CA glue and I have an applicator that I've made from snipping the end off of the eye of a needle. That way I get really precise placement of the super glue. And I use this on extremely fine gaps or extremely fine depressions on the uh, fuselage. And I let it dry for about 20 minutes to about 30 minutes. You don't want to go any longer than that because then it becomes much more difficult to sand off. And right now you can see that I'm using an extremely fine emery uh, sanding stick to f just get rid of that top layer of super glue. And also I am preserving all of those wonderful rivets and panel lines so I don't have to replace them later on. Before we get into painting, I just want to show what I use for pitot tubes. I get these irrigation needle tips. 
and get them on eBay. You get a whole bag of them for a dollar and they come in different sizes. For the Surugi, it was a simple metal tube, but for more uh, complex aircraft, you can actually fit one needle inside of another and make yourself a, a fairly detailed pitot tube. Painting the Surugi was fairly simple. I used LP70 from the Tamiya lacquer range and I absolutely love this paint. It is pretty much the equivalent of their spray aluminum and it is absolutely bulletproof. You don't even need to put a primer coat on uh, and it sprays absolutely beautifully. The problem with painting the Surugi is that since there is no landing gear, there's just points to stick the landing gear on, I had to come up with a very flimsy ramshackle way of securing the plane while I was trying to paint it. Um, as you can see, it, it had it was successful but a little bit flimsy and I really had to watch it. Um, overall, this was all silver um, and I, I chose gloss silver so that it could I could do the later weathering and not have to cover it with a gloss coat. Being a single-use aircraft, the markings on the Surugi are extremely simple. The kit comes with nice-looking decals, but I prefer to spray paint mine on. I have a much more detailed video on how I spray Japanese markings. Essentially, I use the Tamiya masking sheet and an Olfa cutter to make the nice uh, perfect circles. And then I um, mask them off and I paint them. It's a fairly simple process. The only thing that I warn you about is to absolutely make sure that the masks are really pressed down onto the, the, the model and to make sure that when you are spraying, or actually before you spray, um, I mask the entire thing. It's a bit of a, an extra step, but I always seem to overspray when I don't take that extra effort and mask the entire airplane. So here we are, five pounds of painter's tape later. I am spraying the markings. I use a mix of about 50-50 of Tamiya's uh, acrylic red and brown. And in both, well, the red is, is gloss. And I might even throw in a couple of drops of acrylic clear. Again, I'm trying to have a glossy finish so as to avoid needing to do a gloss coat before I do any washes or weather or pin washer or, or weathering. I start my painting with very light coats of the paint and I'm trying to be as perpendicular as I can to the mask. I don't want to shoot paint, for example, I don't want to shoot paint into the corner of the mask or where the mask meets the fuselage. And with progressive light coats, the color fills out fairly quickly and you, um, you, you have perfect markings if you were fortunate to press these masks right into the model. The last bit of painting is the black that went on the top of the fuselage all the way to the cowl. And I'm using gloss black. And again, it's to help me with the later weathering stages so that I don't have to put a gloss coat over top. I wanted to show also this extremely flimsy landing gear that comes with this kit, which I can only assume is a, is a very good recreation of the actual thing. When you assemble this model, be very careful setting the model on this type of landing gear because they will snap if you're not careful. All right, so we are at the final stage of getting this model done. I'm using Flory washes in this case instead of my usual uh, MIG ammo washes just to try a different product. And I, I like this product because it is as foolproof as you're gonna get with a, a weathering product. 
you, you shake up the bottle, you get a, a big old brush, and you slap it on. And if you have a gloss coat, I guess that's the one thing I should say. You really need a gloss coat with this if you're going to slather it on, because if it's not, you're going to have an awful time getting it off and leaving it in the panel lines and rivets. There are rivets all over this model. And to really make them pop, you need to slather on something so that um, you're going to have these rivets come out. The, 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 how you use it is extremely easy. Slap it on, wait about 45 minutes to an hour for it to dry, and then you, uh, you take it off. And if you missed a, a spot or if you've taken off too much, you just reapply and do it again. I'm using moisten Q-tips to get all of the dried flory wash off the model. You're gonna go through a lot of Q-tips if you do it this way. I find it to be a little bit better than say using a paper towel or a cloth because I find when I use those, I take off, I risk taking off at least all of the wash that goes inside the panel lines and the rivets. But like I said, you're going to go through a, an, a, an alarming amount of Q-tips doing it, even on a small fighter like this. And there really is no technique. You just moisten up the Q-tip, you run it across, and you... I, I tend to knock off like the, 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 the big amount right away, and then I do multiple passes to make sure that I take off all of the, the product that's on the surface of the model. It might take, I don't know, it might take two or three passes to be absolutely sure. And uh, it really pays to walk away from the model for a little bit and come back and really give it a good look to make sure that you have taken off all of the flory wash from the, uh, from, the, from the model, from the fuselage and from the wings. Here's a closer look at what I mean you can take off the lion's share of the of the wash but still you're going to have some little traces of it left and you you know i need a couple of passes to make sure that it's all on there but as you can see those rivet lines those panel lines are all nicely highlighted and it's a it's a great finish it it makes it look very clean uh, but definitely detailed And here is the completed Edward 148 scale Surugi. It was a fairly straightforward build. And for anyone that's had some familiarity with kits from the mid 90s to the early 2000s, you should have no problem uh, fixing this one up and getting it to look great. It had a few engineering issues and a couple times the parts were a little bit difficult to remove from the runners but overall it was a great build experience i hope you liked this video it's a little bit of a departure from the techniques that i've been doing because i wanted to incorporate a little bit of history before the build if you like this video and you think that others might as well it would be great if you could like it and subscribe and tell others that uh, that you found something of interest Otherwise, have a great day and happy building.